I, Doofy, seer of truths, have infallible insight into the objective quality of anime and manga. So through an act of divine grace, I will reveal unto you all the 50 best anime and manga of all time. If your favorite series is not here, then it's simply of an inferior quality. Cope as you may in the comments, but I will not entertain individuals whose minds have been clouded by emotion and bias. For there is only one objectively correct list, and it's mine. Because of the scope of this list, I've restricted myself to series I've completed or I'm up to date with. Naturally, this excludes a lot of stuff I genuinely enjoy, but haven't experienced enough. Moreover, it would be impossible for me to justify each ranking without making this video absurdly long, so I'll only discuss series where I feel like saying something, and even then, I'll keep my remarks relatively brief. At number 50, we have Hunter x Hunter. This may come as a shock to some, but let me explain. I don't have anything bad to say about Hunter x Hunter, and in fact, I would argue that on some level, it achieves a level of sophistication that most battle shonen could only dream of. The problem though, is that this never really translates into a powerful enough emotional experience that would justify placing it any higher. So while I appreciate what it's done for the genre, it just didn't do enough for me. Number 49 is The Music of Marie. Aesthetically, this is Usamaru Furuya's best work. This retro-futurist utopia is presented in Furuya's trademark surrealist style. Intricate steampunk designs are situated within a dreamlike and ethereal atmosphere to create a visually rich world. Thematically as well, the work employs many philosophically dense themes, the most developed of which revolving around the question of what genuine happiness is. The manga also gestures towards other ideas like the relationship between societal progress and religious conservatism. Although some aspects of this relationship are depicted in rather simple terms, the simplicity allows them to translate into strong visual metaphors. The manga's biggest shortcoming, however, is Furuya's inability to trust his readers. Any semblance of subtlety is undermined by excessive exposition. There's little room for us to read between the lines, which takes away from the overall experience. Number 48 is Devilman. Devilman's a manga that needs no introduction. Its unique blend of action and horror made it a standout among other Monster of the Week manga early on. Near the end of its serialization, however, it would challenge the conventions of the medium with its especially dark and complex narrative. Now, despite its importance to the history of manga, it's still very much a product of its time. A lot of the early chapters suffer from excessive and unnatural exposition, and the basic superhero structure with Akira and Ryo working together to fight demons becomes quickly repetitive. It's not until the last couple volumes that this manga hits its stride, bringing the world building and lore to the forefront, but even then, it's riddled with pacing issues. Some interactions are far too strung out, while other, important moments are almost entirely skipped. Fortunately, its notoriously bleak ending is one that still packs a punch almost 50 years later, making it a must-read for all manga fans who can stomach its grim delivery. Number 47 is Death Note. Despite all its flaws, especially in the second half, the sort of cat and mouse chase between Light and L in the first half of the series is one of the most engaging mental battles that the medium has to offer. At number 46 is the cult classic delinquent manga, Rainbow. 45 is Kids on the Slope. This is Jazz the series, and I don't just mean that in the literal sense of it being about high school kids bonding over music. Jazz is this improvisational art form that allows musicians to express themselves through spontaneous solos that bend and break the conventions of 18th century European music. This is important because the improvisational and spontaneous nature of jazz is also inherent to these characters' actions. They're young and inexperienced, so it's only natural that they fight for no reason and do stupid things. And while it might be easy to isolate these actions and scrutinize them for their irrationality, much like a jazz solo, you can't fully appreciate the underlying beauty without placing these actions in the context of their relationships to others. To put it in terms of the metaphor, each character is an imperfect jazz solo whose beauty is only understood in the song of life. At number 44, we have Barakamon. Barakamon distinguishes itself because of its extraordinarily relatable protagonist, Sei Honda. Initially, Sei is arrogant and sensitive to criticism, so much so that when a veteran calligrapher labels his work as bland and unoriginal, Sei physically lashes out. 
However, over the course of the series, he embarks on this journey of self-discovery, where he learns to open up to others. By the end of the series, he's able to produce a piece of calligraphy that reflects this growth. And while it fails to win him an award, he succeeds in producing something uniquely him. He's at peace with himself and no longer requires external validation. This is a trajectory that I myself have experienced here on YouTube, making Say's story all the more moving. Number 43 is Your Lie in April. This one's more of a sentimental pick. It's a series that my wife and I watched together early in our relationship. We've shed a lot of tears over the show, and I hold it near and dear to my heart for that reason. Number 42 is D. Gray Man. D. Gray Man's one of several battles shown on this list, but what sets it apart is Katsura Hoshino's art and her handling of the manga's mysteries. On the one hand, Hoshino's use of Victorian style clothing and historical architecture lends itself to this gothic atmosphere that perfectly complements the series' more tragic themes. On the other hand, she keeps readers engaged with her careful handling of various ongoing mysteries, such as Alan's connection to the Millennium Earl and the true nature of the Noah family, two plot points that have been on fire in the past few volumes. At number 41, we have Jujutsu Kaisen. Now, JJK is a battle shonen that knows its history. It studied the greats and executes a lot of our favorite tropes with style. I'm certain that there will be a whole generation who revere this series the same way mine did the big three. Number 40 is Chainsaw Man. Up until the Gun Devil arc, Chainsaw Man's practically indistinguishable from any of its contemporaries. We as readers cheer Denji on as he progresses through the hero's journey towards his dream of a normal life. However, that all comes crashing down in the final arcs of part one, where Tatsuki Fujimoto presents an explicit critique of that path. Here we see Denji's short-sighted pursuit of the normal life promised by Makima has a rather dissatisfactory end. This idea of chasing your dreams, whether it's something as ambitious as becoming Hokage, or something as mundane as wanting a normal life, can be unfulfilling, and in fact, often distracts us from appreciating the beauty in everyday moments. It's the Nietzschean parable, God is dead and we have killed him. Our central ideal, the promise of a cathartic release, is a hoax, and the realization of this has a drastic effect, which Fujimoto continues to explore deep into part two. 39 is Memories of Imanon. Imanon's beauty lies in its ability to capture the essence of a seemingly inconsequential moment, one that vanishes as quickly as it appears, but does so in a way that honors the memory. Now you might be wondering, how can a manga about something so trivial rank so highly? Well, just think about it. Isn't life just a series of big moments cushioned between the inconsequential? One day you'll graduate, get a job, possibly get married, and maybe even have a kid. These are big, impactful moments, and lots of manga thrive on telling stories around them. But these are just the highlights. What makes Imanon special is how it celebrates the more mundane moments in between. Whether it's the conversation you had while waiting at the barber, or the small talk you made with a the cashier. These little moments add up, and by giving us one such moment, memories of Imanon remind us to appreciate them from time to time. At number 38, we have Yokohama Kairashi Kiko. It's fitting that this series follows Imanon as its message is fundamentally similar. It encourages us to appreciate the beauty in everyday moments, but does so in a very different way. Unlike Imanon, which offers a gentle celebration of the more mundane moments, YKK depicts a post-apocalyptic world and fills it with characters who are aware of its inevitable decay, yet live lives with a gentle acceptance of it. Despite this bleak premise, it has a rather calming atmosphere that provides readers with a sense of peace and calm. Even in the more dire moments, moments when characters are confronted with the erosion of humanity and the memories of what was, the series maintains this meditative quality that stays with you long after you put it down. Number 37 is One Piece. Despite my rather tumultuous relationship with One Piece and its fans, I do recognize that it's a special series. Once I stopped trying to view it in the same battle shonen light as I did Naruto and Bleach, and started to view it for what it really is, that being a fun, goofy adventure manga, I found myself enjoying it a hell of a lot more. Number 36 is Mushishi. Mushishi has this wonderfully meditative quality that can be attributed to several writing decisions. For one, Mushishi takes a more minimalist approach to storytelling. It doesn't try to develop a wide cast of characters with an overarching plot. Rather, each episode focuses on a different issue within a different community or household. Similarly, its protagonist Ginkgo doesn't receive the full scope of development we might expect. This works in the show's favor as Ginkgo becomes the vehicle through which the story is told. 
Just as we, the viewers, experience the series of unconnected events, so too does Ginkgo as he roams around Japan and encounters various issues. We don't always get the full story, and some stories go unresolved, but this style of writing helps contribute to the more holistic view of the show. Much like Ginkgo, we often find ourselves at the end of a conflict, or observing other conflicts with no resolution in sight. Furthermore, not all stories in Mushishi have happy endings. It truly explores the full spectrum of human emotions, and unlike other series that hold your hand through the tough times, Mushishi shows you that sometimes life sucks, and that's okay. This sort of focused and minimal approach, together with its super serene and hauntingly calm atmosphere, helps foster that meditative quality, and makes for one of the best anime experiences out there. Number 35 is A Girl on the Shore. What I appreciate about A Girl on the Shore is its willingness to openly explore the complications that arise during young relationships. Unlike other manga that tackle middle school love stories, Inyo Sano pulls no punches and is not afraid to highlight all the horrible things that naturally follow from the lack of experience, immaturity, and underdeveloped moral compasses that are characteristic of this time in our lives. There's a certain rawness and emotional honesty here that is rare among manga of this type. At number 34 we have my first Osamu Tezuka manga, The Book of Human Insects. Now we all know Tezuka as the godfather of manga, having authored hundreds of manga in his lifetime, laying the foundation for the manga industry as we know it today. Despite this, my initial impressions of Tezuka were based on his more juvenile works, something like Astro Boy and Kimbo the White Lion. So when I read The Book of Human Insects for the first time, you can only imagine how shocked I was when just 11 pages in, I was greeted with a woman hanging herself. It's like going into a movie expecting The Lion King, but getting American Psycho. Since then, I've read half a dozen other titles, and while I'm sure there are other Tezuka manga worthy of being on this list, my unique experience with this title makes it all the more special to me. At number 33, we have Kazuo Yumezu's horror classic, The Drifting Classroom. It's Lord of the Flies meets 70s Japanese horror, a must read for any horror fan, especially for you Jinji Ito fans in the audience. At number 32 we have Welcome to the NHK. NHK is similar to other titles on this list in that it focuses a lot on relevant issues for people in their teens and 20s, particularly issues around mental health and social isolation. However, what sets NHK apart is how it delivers these themes with a strong sense of humor, making fun of everything and everyone from conspiracy theorists to otaku culture. The thematic force of this approach is that it can show the absurdity of certain beliefs by bringing them to the logical extreme and presenting that in a humorous light. In this way, it offers somewhat of a commentary on certain beliefs without ever belittling them or making them feel unimportant. Number 31 is Serial Experiments Lane, an eerily prophetic anime that is somehow more relevant now than when it was released over two decades ago, one that explores the influence of technology and the line between the virtual and real worlds. Number 30 is Inside Mari. Here, Shuzo Oshimi employs his signature psychoanalytic style to explore complex psychological themes such as personal identity and self-discovery. How this work stands out from his others, though, is in his delicate treatment of gender issues, particularly those around body dysmorphia and societal expectations. Number 29 is Believers, a quaint little manga about the everyday routine of three cult members as they seek to rid themselves of modernity's corrupt influences, especially those which promote sexual desires. What this manga portrays particularly well is the tension between our commitment to ideology and the unconscious desires baked into our very nature. The three cult members enrolled in the program of their own volition, which demonstrates that, rationally, they understand the need to purify themselves of society's influence. However, over the course of the story, they find that the supposedly rational demands of the program are at odds with some of their fundamental human desires. The story, then, can be best described as a battlefield between these ideological demands and our inherent desires. Which is more powerful, which we ought to follow, and whether a balance can be struck between the two. At number 28 we have Downfall. Downfall is best thought of as a semi-autographic work by Asano that, above all, highlights the complex relationship that many find themselves in with their career, and how that affects both them as individuals and those around them. This is exemplified by our protagonist, who occupies an interesting place. He continues creating manga, despite his passion for the medium having long since faded. All that remains is his empty yet compulsive behavior to continue onwards. He begrudgedly creates to the detriment of his social relations, neglecting those around him with no reward in sight. 
This is a somewhat familiar situation to many, which makes this manga serve as an important reminder to stop what you're doing from time to time and appreciate those around you. Number 27 is Naoki Urasawa's critically acclaimed monster. 26 is Dead Dead Demons Destruction. Just a gang of kids living life to the fullest in the wake of the world's demise. Ah, it doesn't get much better than this. Number 25 is Pluto, which, for my money, offers the same emotional force as Monster, but in a tighter, more cohesive package. Now at number 24, we have Fooly Cooly. Many have sung the praises of Fooly Cooly, and I'm no different. From its standout production, both visually and sonically, to its nuanced symbolism, it is the quintessential coming-of-age anime. That said, my love for this series extends beyond the qualities of the show and to the creative processes involved in its production. Tsurumaki Kazuya has made it abundantly clear that Fooly Cooly is the culmination of all of his interests, which he sought to present in the style of a Japanese commercial. It's eclectic in nature, and that's by design. In this way, Fooly Cooly wasn't created with an eye to some universal understanding of what a conventionally good anime should be, but rather as an extension of Kazuya's particular interests at the time. While another writer might have approached this kind of story by appealing to popular conventions of the time, Kazuya looked within himself and found something universal. By making something so earnestly in the image of himself, he was able to grasp some truly universal experience that has made this work timeless. Number 23 is Arigato. Despite its grotesque content, Arigato offers a rather profound commentary on the conflict between public and private life, and more specifically, the problems that arise when we make our private lives subservient to our public image. Naoki Yamamoto accomplishes this by applying this belief to a whole community of people and demonstrating just how far people will go for the sake of their public image. Take the father, for example. Page after page, we see the father engage in absurd and even destructive behavior to protect as much of his family's public image as possible. This belief leads him as far as attempting to murder his own daughter, as he believes this is what's best for her, or more precisely, her public image. Highlighting this absurdity is only a fraction of Yamamoto's genius, yet it often gets overlooked due to the graphic nature of his works. At number 22, we have Blood on the Tracks. What made Blood on the Track so special was its focused storytelling. It knew exactly what it wanted to do and how to do it. It was this horrifying case study on generational trauma. Oshimi's attention to detail with how trauma affects individuals and their relationships was truly second to none. The interactions and behaviors displayed, while abstract and exaggerated at times, felt real. However, this would all change halfway through when the manga began to ask far too much of its readers in terms of suspending their disbelief, whether it's through these nearly impossible events or confused moral messaging. This is all the result of Oshimi trying to overcomplicate the psychological aspect of the work, which unfortunately undermined a lot of what the first half was trying to set up. Because of that, what could have been a top 10 series now sits at number 22. Still a great manga, but a far shot from what it could have been. At number 21 is Kabi Nagata's Autobiographies. As the title of her second series, My Solo Exchange Diary, suggests, these aren't traditional stories. These are diaries, and as diaries, they violate almost every convention of story writing. The pacing of events is clumsy, they're not structured with some overarching purpose, and her excessive narration often errs on the side of telling, not showing. However, that's precisely what makes these works appealing. Her writing style perfectly mirrors the series of dilemmas in her own life. Not every through line is neatly resolved by the end, because Nagata herself is still actively dealing with many of these issues, whether it's mental illness, an eating disorder, her sexuality, or alcoholism. Her emotional vulnerability is her biggest virtue, as she details her struggle with how cold and unforgiving the world outside of high school can be. I understand that this type of storytelling is not for everyone, but the way she describes certain issues deeply resonates with my own experience, elevating her manga to such a high rank. At number 20 we have Gaunt's. Now listen, I don't have anything profound to say here. Gaunt's is just a stupid fun series, and sometimes just being stupid fun is good enough to get you this high. At number 19 we have Nozokiana, the hentai that made Giga cry. Number 18 is Ping Pong. The more I think about it, the more I realize that Tayu Matsumoto might have my favorite art style. It's scratchy in a way that conveys motion and energy, but also expressive in a kind of abstract way. 
For example, when he depicts ping pong matches, he makes use of very exaggerated perspectives, emphasizing certain features to represent why that person is in the game, why they're fighting. With each panel, we feel both the physical force, and more importantly, the emotional force of the players as they swing their paddles. In this way, the games are more of a battle of emotion than a battle of skill, and Matsumoto is careful to depict that in his art. Number 17 is Shaman King. There's a tendency among fans to reduce certain battle shonen down to one element, whether it's One Piece with its world building, Naruto with its choreography, or Hunter x Hunter with its power system. Although this overlooks much of what makes these series great, it's a useful entry point for discussing a series. And so for Shaman King, the element I want to talk about is its characters. Shaman King's cast combines a wide array of cultural references, from cartoon characters to actors and bands, with more traditional shonen archetypes, like the classic shonen rival, Ren. Since the manga is centered around the Shaman Fight, an international tournament to crown the Shaman King, dozens of countries and cultures have a home in Shaman King, leading itself to a diverse cast of rich designs and intriguing perspectives. Above all, however, stands the series protagonist Yo. Unlike other shonen protagonists, Yo's goals are much humbler. Sure, he participates in the Shaman Fight, but his dream becoming of Shaman King isn't some noble deed, but rather a means of bringing about a peaceful and worry-free life. Now, I think people tend to write off Yo as too simple, but when you look beneath the surface, you'll find a rather robust philosophy of life. A philosophy that values following the natural ebb and flow of things, and living in the moment such that you embrace both the good and the bad. At its core, it's a philosophy that combines ideas of coexistence with acceptance in a shared space. This is quite rare as far as shonen pro tags go, giving Shaman King its unique edge. At number 16 we have Not Simple. Not Simple captivates readers with its fragmented, non-linear storytelling and minimalist art style, using simple, clean lines to convey complex emotions. This highlights the emotional depth of the characters as they navigate difficult themes like familial trauma and the search for belonging. Natsumi Ono presents a world where characters face morally grey situations, where there are no easy answers. There's a sense of realism in how life's difficulties are depicted without idealized resolutions. This makes for an absolutely gripping drama that's hard to put down once you pick up. Number 15 is Three Days of Happiness. Three Days of Happiness makes use of one of my favorite literary tropes. It takes an otherwise ordinary world and introduces some sci-fi element to enrich the possible interactions between characters. In this series, that element is the ability to sell some portion of your life. What's interesting about this is twofold. For one, you have someone telling you the worth of your life, so how that influences your self-worth during your final days is an excellent topic to explore. But for another, you have the knowledge of when you'll die, which, again, can lead to some rather extreme behavior. Taken together, these lay the foundation for Three Days of Happiness. What I personally love about the series is how real the relationships feel despite the short time we spend with them, and I believe this largely has to do with the consequences of the sci-fi element introduced from the onset. Number 14 is Oshimi's magnum opus, The Flowers of Evil. A story that deals with the struggles of adolescence and explores the psychological depths of our protagonist, Katsuga, as he navigates the insecurities and discomfort many experience as teenagers. The real force of the series lies in its dark and unsettling tone, which blends elements of horror and psychological drama to deliver an utterly frightening reading experience. Number 13 is Solanin. Here, Asano perfectly captures that feeling of uncertainty many of us experience in our early 20s. That time in our lives when we're fresh out of college and lunged into the workforce without a moment to breathe. Our protagonist Mako finds herself in the all too familiar situation of working a decent paying office job, but feels deeply dissatisfied. She doesn't know what she wants, but she knows it's not this, and so she makes the hasty decision to quit her job. The manga then follows Mako on her path as she attempts to discover who she is and what she wants. Again, much like some of the other series on this list, it's Asano's ability to execute such relatable themes in these painfully realistic ways that makes Salonen such a highly rated manga for me. Number 12 is Neon Genesis Evangelion. Now, Eva's a show whose reputation precedes it, so I'll spare you my little 40 second dollar store analysis. 
However, I would like to take this opportunity to discuss a principle that applies to most titles on this list, but Ava more than others. A lot of people, myself included, use a cognitive shortcut called the effort heuristic. This idea that the perceived value of an object is determined by the amount of effort invested in it. For example, if we spend a lot of time researching a series and developing a particular interpretation, then we're likely to value that interpretation, and by extension, the show itself, a lot more than if we hadn't. The reason this is relevant here is because Ava is a series that invites and rewards viewers for looking deeper into it more than any other series on this list. The number of hours I've put into reading online articles, watching obscure video essays, and poring over small sections of the series just to figure something out is borderline psychotic, but it's all that work that contributes to my high evaluation of the series. At number 11 we have Bleach. I think Bleach spent a long time living in the shadow of Naruto and One Piece, but since the announcement of the Thousand Year Blood War adaptation back in 2020, the series has seen renewed interest, and with it, a newfound respect. It's no longer just the younger, stylish brother of the big three, but an entry that can stand on its own, worthy of respect on its own merits. Looking back at the series, the subtlety of Tite Kubo's writing is remarkable. Many have criticized Kubo for giving Ichigo each and every power-up, making his victories feel cheap and undeserved, but a deeper analysis reveals a brilliantly profound take on self-discovery and the struggle to reconcile different aspects of oneself. Whether it's his identity as a human, a soul reaper, or a hollow, each represents some part of Ichigo that he grapples to understand, but ultimately brings together in a cathartic moment of self-acceptance at the end of the series. This is definitely not just another brain-dead shonen, and I'm glad to see it no longer being treated as such. And now we've entered the top 10. At number 10 we have Full Metal Alchemist. What can be said about Full Metal Alchemist? Decades after its original release, FMA remains one of the highest rated series of all time. The way it handles this robust cast of characters, weaving multiple subplots into one overarching epic is nothing short of a spectacle. Now, for the purposes of this list, I've included both the 2003 anime and Brotherhood in one entry. While I like Brotherhood more overall, what the 2003 anime adapts faithfully is generally better, such as the Shao Tucker incident or the funeral. This has a lot to do with the production of the 2003 anime lending itself to a more solemn mood, but it's precisely that moodiness which heightens these already amazing experiences. Moreover, Brotherhood is rather infamous for its fast pacing early on, but when complemented by the slower pace of the 2003 adaptation, you're given a much fuller picture of these characters. At number 9 we have Gurren Lagann. Gurren Lagann is, for my money, the best animated series on this list. Now, I could go on and on about its larger-than-life movements, fluid action sequence, bold lines and vibrant colors, but frankly, an anime is only as good as what it animates, and I believe it's the epic scale of Gurren Lagann that propels it to new heights. The gradual build-up from internal conflicts within small communities to intergalactic battles for the fate of the universe provides viewers with increasing stakes across the series, keeping us constantly engaged. This, together with its inspiring themes of believing in yourself, and iconic catchphrases like believe in the me who believes in you, comes together to form one of the most iconic and memorable anime you'll ever see. Number 8 is Darker Than Black. Darker Than Black is sort of like Cowboy Bebop's younger film noir brother. Created by Tensei Okamura, previously known for his storyboarding on Cowboy Bebop, Darker Than Black uses a bi-episodic structure in service of its world building. Each mini-arc offers an in-depth look at a different character, and in doing so, reveals a different aspect about the world. This way, the show doesn't focus on building up this grand mystery that's concluded with an especially cathartic climax, rather it focuses on creating a series of intimate stories that come together to create a world that feels alive. A world that feels just as real as the one we live in. The presentation of this world is farther enhanced by Yoko Kano's score, whose mix of atmospheric, moody, and intense compositions help reflect the show's dark and mysterious themes, which contributes to the overall film noir style the show's going for. At number 7 we have Eden of the East. A lot of people I talk to are confused about why I love this show so much, and fair enough. It doesn't do nearly as much as it could've with its phenomenal concept giving 12 individuals a cell phone with 10 billion yen and an artificial intelligence that can carry out any task to save Japan. However, it does just enough to execute its core theme perfectly, a theme that many overlook. 
On the surface, it's a story about these different people and their take on how to save Japan. Whether it's bribing politicians to push for certain laws, or paying off cops to turn a blind eye to vigilantism. But what we see over the course of the show is that throwing money at these individual issues isn't enough to bring stability to the nation. What's required is bringing people together to address these problems as a group. And I think the often criticized ending of the second film concludes this theme perfectly. At number 6 we have Goodnight Pun Pun. This is the fifth Asano manga on my list, and by far his most popular and critically acclaimed. So I'll spare you any more glazing. But it should go without saying that Pun Pun is a modern classic. A series that makes the best of the visual format and delivers one of the most gut-wrenching stories of our generation. Coming in at number 5 we have Attack on Titan. The term world building gets thrown around a lot with little regard for its meaning. For some, just having a big world is good world building, but for me, world building is a much more all-encompassing term. It's not just the geography and physical environment of a world, but the different cultures and societies that inhabit it, their history, the various political and economic circumstances, and how these are all connected. Now, I'm not suggesting we need a J.R.R. Tolkien-length novel explaining every detail of the world, but we should be able to infer a lot of these details from how characters interact and events unfold. Given that, I believe Attack on Titan has the most thorough world building of any series on this list, because each minute detail has a coherent explanation that moves the plot forward, and more importantly, is foreshadowed to some extent. Even on the most surface level, we can see the depth of thought put into something like the armed forces of Eldia. From the division of the three branches, to their various functions and structures, military formations and tactics, the mechanics and uses of the vertical maneuvering equipment, and so on. Each detail is thought through in a way that makes sense for the story it's trying to tell. Now, AOT's world building and its foreshadowing has been extensively covered by other content creators. So I'll keep it at that for now, but I would be amiss to mention AOT in 2024 without discussing its ending. I'm not going to try and convince you one way or another about its quality. I personally thought the ending was fine, and have yet to see a real takedown critique that would change my mind. However, even if we were to pretend that the ending was god-awful, that doesn't somehow invalidate everything that came before it. While a bad ending is a blemish on an otherwise great series, it doesn't take away from my past enjoyment. And regardless, this isn't even the case for Attack on Titan. Number 4 is Beck Mongolian Chop Squad. What Beck does exceedingly well is its depiction of band life and how that can influence our own lives. Koyuki is a great protagonist because over the course of the manga, we see him develop from an otherwise insecure and uninteresting boy into a confident and inspiring leader. And much of this development is the result of how he deals with certain tensions that arise within the band. It's not an overly ambitious manga. Beck is a normal band doing normal things, but Harold Sakuishi has taken great care to paint a realistic picture of band life. From the struggles of writing music and the conflicts that arise over creative differences, to the bureaucracy and politics of the music scene. This speaks to me specifically as I've experienced similar developments in my own life and the various musical projects I've worked on. But my appreciation for this series go beyond this personal connection. Beck is a manga that oozes passion for music. It's obvious that Sakuishi has tremendous respect for the medium, as the manga is littered with references to classic rock. Altogether, this was one of my most formative pieces of media, and it's only natural that I pay respect to it by placing it so high. At number 3 we have No Longer Human. Furuya's adaptation of the timeless Japanese classic recontextualizes Osamu Dazai's original themes of alienation and personal identity in a more modern setting, helping emphasize the lasting relevance of this work on our lives today. At number 2, we have the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise, and specifically the first three entries. Now, despite its overwhelming popularity, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a franchise that's largely written off as just for kids, and fair enough. But you know what else is technically just for kids? Hunter x Hunter, Jujutsu Kaisen, and all these other manga serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump. Listen, all I'm saying is that if your only memories of Yu-Gi-Oh! are of the four kids dub as a child when your media literacy skills are at their weakest, then I don't expect you to think too highly of the franchise. But having revisited it much later in life, I can assure you that Yu-Gi-Oh! is written with care. And if you'd like a more detailed analysis, I would invite you to check out my Yu-Gi-Oh! is better than you remember video. And finally, my favorite series of all time is Naruto. At the end of the day, the gap between Naruto and every other piece of media I've consumed is damn near infinite. If I haven't made it clear already, what I value most isn't just the particular qualities of a series, but also my experience with it. 
and the impact Naruto has had on my life is monumental. It's the first anime that seriously introduced me to the medium. I would stay up late in elementary school watching it on YTV. I showed it to my friends, and before long, it spread through a group like wildfire. We all had our favorites. One friend's favorite was Kiba. Another's was Shino. Everyone had their guy. A piece of them in the series, and someone to root for. We would spend our lunches making paper shuriken and kunai, running around the schoolyard like shinobi. Even as we got older, we would still hold regular watch parties, re-watching the show or introducing other friends to it. And this would extend beyond grade school. I remember a house party after our high school graduation, where a group of us spent the night on the back deck, wasted, arguing about whether Zabuza or Suigetsu was stronger. As you can see, Naruto fostered a sense of community that lasted a lifetime. This wasn't just another anime or manga, it was a movement. That said, I've spent enough time with Naruto to garner a certain intellectual appreciation for it as well. I'm not just trying to say that Naruto is my favorite because of these personal factors, as I do genuinely believe that not only does a lot of things right, but a lot of stuff better than the vast majority of other series. However, there are a lot smarter people out there who have done a much better defense of Naruto than I ever could, and so I'll just leave you with my story. And so that concludes my 50 favorite anime and manga. Let me know what you think of this list in the comments below, and feel free to share your own favorites as well. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, and until next time, my name is Doofy, thanks for watching.